Your Highness, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this special plenary session. A year ago, many of us were here in this room when Her Highness launched Educate a Child, a mission to combat the shocking numbers of out-of-school children around the world. One year on, that program has achieved a significant milestone because today, Educate a Child reaches two million children in different parts of the world. It is one part of education above all, the foundation that brings together all Her Highness's international educational initiatives. But the starting point was to reach the forgotten children, those who barely make it into the official statistics, those who are the hardest to find and the hardest to help. So let's think of it as educating at the extreme. At the turn of the millennium, with much hope the world made a promise. A promise that in 15 years, no child would be denied a quality primary education. A promise underwritten by the UN as a guaranteed human right. With less than 800 days to go, there are at least 57 million children who are still denied access to primary education around the world. Hidden in this number, hidden in the extreme challenges of geography, deprivation, violence, and cultural taboo are human stories. Stories of families living at the edge, stories of desperation, and stories of hardship difficult to imagine. Conviver com muito esgoto, lixo, isso é uma das maiores dificuldades assim, da, da comunidade para as crianças de hoje em dia. O mundo do tráfico hoje em dia cada vez aumenta mais assim, com adolescentes e jovens, porque acho que vão ser, ter tudo mais fácil na vida, aí preferem entrar para a vida do tráfico. Cultural practices like early marriage in India cut short girls' education. This area que a grande बालिकाओं को शिक्षा के लेकर बहुत सी प्रॉब्लम्स आती हैं जैसे यहां का माहौल है सबसे मोटी बात तो लोगों की सोच हो गई है कि लड़कियों को पढ़ाना नहीं चाहिए लड़कियां पढ़ लिख के क्या करेगी आखिर तो उनको वो चूल्हा चौका वही संभालना है रोटी बनानी है सब्जी बनानी है वो तो घर के सीमित दायरे में रहना है उनको बाहर नहीं जाना है Isolated tribal communities in Brazil's Amazon struggle to find a balance between keeping their traditions alive and enabling their children to participate in the modern world. Tudo que tá faltando aqui para a escola melhorar, melhorar a escola indígena. Faltando melhorar a merenda da escola, o livro didático e nós precisa também de ajuda de de algum apoio para construir a língua indígena na própria língua, fazer um dicionário na língua. Extreme poverty can push parents into making economic decisions that are detrimental to their children's future. In RDC, it is estimated at about 7 million children in the school. There is an economic problem, there is the poverty, and it needs to be paid for the school of their children. The children need to contribute to the needs of the family. And sometimes you see that the children are obliged to work, to do small jobs, to do small jobs, to do small jobs, and sometimes they work in the mines, which is also a dangerous job. There are also people who don't believe in the importance of education. The Amazon is one of the most difficult places to find children. Natural disasters put additional pressure on poor infrastructure and scarce resources. Chaque fois donc nous renouvelons les bâtiments puisque quand il y a la pluie, les bâtiments tombent. Et quand les bâtiments tombent, on voit qu'il y a une perturbation de l'ordre des classes dans notre école. Donc on associe maintenant les classes au lieu d'avoir deux classes mais on a une seule classe. Et cela ne permet pas maintenant de bien étudier. Half of out-of-school children live in or are fleeing from conflict-affected zones. They need education more than ever. 
We are working uh, with Syrian refugees. The violence that happened there, some of them lost all their families, and some of them, they've been through uh, friends being shot in front of them. The way they lived it, it is really um, heavy for them. So some of the children are really, really suffering. It hurts. These stories are repeated 57 million times every day across the world. It's not that the world has forgotten these children, it's that we have not kept our promise to them. Educate a Child, a global program of the Education Above All Foundation, created by Her Highness Sheikha Moza bint Nasser in 2012, has set about finding the children behind these numbers, the children behind the stories. In partnership with international, educational organizations, local groups, and funding agencies, we are working on bringing education to these children wherever they are. By working together, we can do more. By creating alliances and combining our efforts, we can keep our promise to every child, to be the first generation where all children, no matter where they live, are guaranteed a quality primary education. Join us in making this promise a reality. And thank you to Meryl Streep for lending us her voice for that film. This is such a challenging reality. But on the positive side, there is a lot of valuable work being done right now that is making a difference. It's being done by many different partners and projects. And it's being showcased right here in the conference center in the Education Above All Village, which is a specially set up interactive space where all of you can learn more about the work that's going on and debate the challenges because there are activities taking place in the village all the time and also films and photographs that bring the work in the field to life. So if you haven't seen it already, please do visit. In a moment, we're going to be discussing the work that's been done and the challenges that lie ahead. And you can be part of that conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag WISE13 and a second hashtag education above all. But now, one year on from the launch of Educate a Child, let's take a closer look at the journey. Educate a Child was launched one year ago with the ambition of getting millions of children into school. The most recent UNESCO figures show that the overall number of out-of-school children has dropped from 61 to 57 million. A lot of progress has been made in Asia, but little progress has been made in Africa, where the largest number of out-of-school children reside. According to official figures, the $1.9 billion currently allocated to basic education per annum in low-income countries is less than 10% of what's required. This funding gap requires an investment from all sectors. There is also a vital need for greater advocacy for children's rights to education in conflict zones. The legal framework to protect children's education exists and criminals are starting to come before the International Criminal Court for violations. But children are still the victims as schools are destroyed by warring factions. In Syria alone, UNICEF estimates more than two million children are out of school and the effect on their lives is devastating. Over the last 12 months, a growing global movement to reduce the total number has been ignited. Today, Educated Child and its partners around the world are offering a quality, sustainable primary education to more than two million children. And EAC is setting its sights on a target of 10 million children back into school by the end of the 2015 school year. To hit that number requires new ways of working and thinking. That includes a multi-sectoral approach that will create alliances with other complementary sectors, a search for additional funds from previously untapped sources, 
and the support of a civil society awoken to the issue of out-of-school children. So, there are two million children already reached by this programme, but there's so much more to do. And let's just highlight for a moment those countries in which education above all is already up and running. There are 24 of them across the globe. There they are now, but let me remind you of the target, 10 million children to be reached by the end of the 2015 to 2016 school year. So what you see in the lists of countries there, the first two columns are the countries already reached, and then the last column on the right-hand side is the next stage of the program. And that next stage will bring in countries as diverse as Afghanistan and Angola, the Philippines and South Africa. So in a few years' time, that is how the map of the countries reached by education above all will look. But there are still many parts of the world which are home to especially hard to reach children. Take Brazil, for example. Her Highness has recently been there. You saw both the Rosinha favela in Rio and also an indigenous tribal area of the Amazon. So in Rio, the issue in the favela is violence and crime. But in that indigenous tribal area, people face an acute dilemma in trying to keep their culture alive and their language alive, but at the same time needing to prepare their children for the outside world. So that's one country, but two very different educational challenges. And then let's look at another example of educating at the extreme, the Democratic Republic of Congo. 31% of school-age children here have never set foot in a classroom. And that means that up to 7 million children are out of school in this one country. Entire generations have had their education stunted, if not destroyed, by violence. And in some parts of the world, girls face particular hurdles. Rajasthan in India, for example, where education above all is working with a local NGO. Here, 40% of girls drop out before they reach the fifth grade. Many married off while still under the legal age and only one in a hundred girls in the whole of rural India ever reaches the end of the 12th grade. And then there are children in conflict zones, those who you are most likely to see on the news. 40% of all Syrians in grades one to nine are now refugees. Two million Syrian children have dropped out of school. In Lebanon alone, half a million Syrian children will be living as refugees by the end of this year, so within the next couple of months. So the task is immense, but there is progress being made and there are partnerships that are making a difference. So let's hear now from some of the people who are working in this area and who are achieving that difference. I'd like to invite Her Highness and our panelists to join me on stage. Thank you. Welcome to you all. So, alongside Her Highness, uh, we have Gordon Brown, former British Prime Minister, now the UN's Special Envoy on Global Education, Irina Bukova representing UNESCO, Anthony Lake representing UNICEF, Antonio Guterres representing UNHCR, Filippo Grandi representing UNRWA, and Hans-Jürgen Bierfels representing the German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. Some of you were here at exactly this point last year when Educate a Child was launched. Your Highness, it's been a year of achievement. How do you look back on this year? What would you say the lessons are of what's been done? Yes, it, been, it has been a very exciting uh, year. Uh, and we learned a lot through this year. And I can say, say that uh, the main uh, two highlights uh, that, uh, to me, they stand out as uh, 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 milestones that we learned through these years are first uh, the, um, the, this uh, concept of uh, global resource mobilization <coughs> is coming uh, to fruition. This uh, concept is based on, to, uh, on uh, the multi sector approach where partners coming from different expertise, from different domain, coming with their know how. Uh, to the same uh, cause. Uh, they are bringing their, their knowledge, they are looking to the root cause of the problem, 
It's trying to address the problem from a comprehensive uh, uh, perspective. For example, in Kakuma camp in Kenya, we are partnering uh, with the health sector foundation that's uh, uh, focusing on, uh, on health sector, uh, partnering with uh, foundations that are focusing in, uh, on uh, employabilities, um, uh, uh, other foundations that uh, have the expertise in, uh, in energy, like water, uh, electricity, uh, others, uh, food, security. So this multi-sector approach uh, brings uh, together the uh, uh, sort of uh, well-rounded uh, idea that works uh, uh, around the ecosystem of education to change it. Uh, we found out that this is the, main, the most important component to secure the sustainability of education. The second one is the, that we are today uh, uh, matching uh, our uh, uh, commitment of resources with uh, culture commitment. We understood and we learned that it's not enough just to provide resources, we need to be also sensitive, as you just saw in the film, uh, we have to be sensitive to these cultural identities and uh, to build the trust between the donors or the providers and their learners. You need to, uh, to, to give uh, this kind of confidence uh, to the uh, learners that their uh, culture, their, their, uh, their, uh, uh, their heritage will not be uh, 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 attacked. Uh, uh, it's not, uh, I think, uh, wise to impose uh, our set of, belie of, of beliefs or um, set of ideas or um, uh, our, uh, our approaches on the others. Yeah. It's important that to, to include them, to recognize them, and once we recognize them, we build the confidence and we'll tap onto their uh, aptitudes and their, their capabilities uh, and we'll be able really to change their situations. I think that's, these are the main two uh, issues that we see that they are really uh, 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 listen, uh, uh, learning, and we think that they also reflect the essence of our foundation. And of course, that's just in the course of the last year. And Gordon Brown, when we last spoke about out-of-school children, you told me that you thought there was a, an added urgency today that didn't exist before. Is that really the case? Well, can I start by saying that sometimes you meet someone who is so extraordinary that they change your view of what is possible. And I think we do owe a huge debt of gratitude as we start this conference uh, to Her Highness Sheikha Moza, because she has shown leadership, she has shown compassion, and she has shown vision. And within one year, she has educated two million children. She has plans to increase this to six million. And by 2015-16, that will be 10 million. And I don't think there is any example in the history of the world of a single person doing as much as she is doing for education. And I hope that the whole audience can thank her for what she has done. We're very grateful to you. And, I, and you can see from both the film and what uh, Her Highness has said that it is the forgotten, the neglected, the most in need the hardest to reach children, children in conflict zones, and Tony Lake is here and uh, we have uh, Anwar here, and we'll talk about children in conflict zones later uh, that need our help most of all. Now, the challenge I said last year was that by the end of 2015, our deadline, we had to get as many of these 57 million children into school. While some aid agencies have reduced the support, and that is unacceptable in my view, uh, others have helped more, and so it is possible to imagine 20 million children who are out of school now being in school by the end of 2015. But that leaves 40 million children who will not be in school unless we change what we're doing. And I think over these next two years, we need business, we need foundations, philanthropists, charities, international agencies, government, young people themselves, teachers and educational organizations all to come together with a single goal that will, we will raise, and I believe the figure is around $6 billion in 2015, so that we can get as many of these 40 million children who will otherwise be out of school into school. So I would like you to think this week as we're here to build on the inspiration that Sheikh Moza has given us with the plan for 10 million children to find other funders, other philanthropists, other foundations, other governments, other agencies who are prepared to deal with this fundamental problem that unless we take action, we will not be the generation 
that gets every child to yeah. school, but, and we will have failed. We have got to take this but action talking about the, now. But, to go to, but talking about the forgotten children, Irina Bukova, one of the problems is that even the last statistics that we have arguably are already out of date. We still don't have a definitive picture of how many children out there are out of school altogether. Um, I, I think uh, what, to, what to say about data uh, is crucial, and um, we're always... Um, uh, struck by, by figures when we say it, it has a huge appeal also to the public opinion and uh, just to echo what Gordon said about educate the child. Uh, I think uh, one of the uh, most, uh, I would say, amazing thing is to show that it can be done because very often uh, we are desperate and we say we don't have resources, international donor uh, commitment is uh, failing and uh, no national policies, mobilization, but uh, these two million kids in school, this means it's doable. And this is where I think uh, statistics also in data come. Um, end of uh, September, uh, during the Millennium Development Goal assessment, big event, um, under the leadership of the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, we spoke, all of us here, spoke about a data revolution. Uh, in order to have the right policies, in order to assess what is needed, we need a reliable data. And um, our Institute of Statistics is working also through all different means in order to have this reliable data. Now, but you need the countries becomes, to own up to how many yes, out-of-school children there are. Yes, but it becomes more difficult because we are coming to the 10% of these 57 million out-of-school children are those who can be diffic difficult to reach out. We speak about out, uh, the street children, we speak about marginalized communities, indigenous populations, uh, we speak about children in refugee camps, we speak about these 28 million children that are in conflict areas, so it becomes ever more difficult to get this data. But uh, I think it's important that we use all the possible techniques in order to make this happen, because without this we cannot uh, devise a, a very specific targeted policies and uh, uh, I think what is also important is to very strongly involve governments. We have launched the process of self-assessment, of reporting. We uh, approaching the 2015 uh, Millennium Development Goal Education for All. We think that now is the time to take stock and governments have to be also held responsible. I think it's important to involve the civil society, the private sector, the international donor community, but governments have the prime responsibility yes. of setting the right policies. And through this process of self-assessment, on one side, I hope we will get also more reliable data and also mobilize them to get and the right policies help. in place. Tony Lake, in, in your work uh, with UNICEF, you, you must see these children the for, even the forgotten children. I mean, you are reaching many of those children already, aren't you, through your programs? We are, but not nearly enough. Uh, if I could make maybe just three uh, very short points that occur to me. Uh, and one, let me echo what Gordon said, and my admiration and congratulations on all you're doing, and the wonderful films, which were about the children at the extreme. Willie Sutton, a famous American bank robber, once said uh, when he was asked, why do you rob banks? He said, because that's where the money is. Uh, and similarly, we got to go where the children are. Uh, and first of all, and I was very glad to see the emphasis on this, children in conflict. One half of the children out of school are in conflict settings. And let me just give you one shameful statistic, which is that less than one and a half percent of humanitarian assistance goes to education. And we have to do much better than that. And a second point on the conflict is, yes, this is a violation of children's rights. Yes, we see the horrible images of the children suffering so much. We have to do it for them, but we also have to do it as an investment in the future of these countries, because if the children don't have the schools and they haven't changed in their hearts away from this violence, the next generation is going to perpetuate the same cycles. Point two, very glad to see the emphasis on the forgotten children, and I would add in here children with disabilities. Uh, at UNICEF, this is very much our focus. Uh, in 127 countries around the world, we're working on education on this focus, but especially in 25 uh, right now, to test innovations, because without new innovations, uh, we're not going to make it. Floating schools in Bangladesh, uh, ways in Uganda that we're using cell phones to track whether there are teachers going to schools, what the needs are of the kids, etc. I think it could be transformative. And just a last point, there's another number besides the 57 million that should concern us all, and that's the 250 million children 
who are of fourth grade age who cannot do their numbers, who can, cannot read or write. Half of them are already in school. And unless we infuse all of this with learning and quality as well as bringing the kids into school, then we're never going to get the rates of graduation into secondary school um, and uh, we'll never meet our goal. Yeah. Important not, not to forget the, the quality. And of course, there's the issue of the kids who go to school and then drop out, but I'm sure we'll, we'll get to that as well. Antonio Guterres, if you're a child in a refugee camp, probably one of the things you need above all is some sense of routine and the, the security that school could provide. Yes, and that is, I think, the, the most important contribution of educated child. It's not only the, the resources, but it is the cultural shift that is being induced. First, to understand that in emergencies, we can not only consider life-saving activities as a priority. It's understandable. We are in a, uh, tens of thousands of people crossing a border. So the, the, the logic attitude is move the trucks, bring the tents, find the water, distribute the food, vaccinate the children. Yes, but it's essential to introduce education since the very beginning because many of these emergencies lead to protracted situations. Mm -hmm. And we have to have solutions foreseen since the beginning. So to you make have to see effective. it as urgent at the same time as you're sending education the water Education is as urgent as the life-saving things that we do from the very beginning. And this is now being understood. An educated child is giving a strong contribution for this to be understood by everybody operating in the field, and I hope from donors too. And then the second cultural shift is that we can no longer go on dealing with issues. We need to deal with people. It's the multi-sectoral approach that uh, Her Highness was mentioning. We need to have a comprehensive approach to the needs and the rights of the people we deal with. And obviously, from that point of view, education is an excellent platform. There is no way an education program can be successful if the shelter problems are not addressed, if the water problems, the nutrition problems are not addressed. So having education in the center of our programs, we make sure that partnerships involve every actor and that uh, uh, the needs and the rights of people are seen in a comprehensive way. And finally, one, one note in conflict situations. To, be, to have children in a school is a key tool for protection. It's not only developing their skills, developing personality, developing uh, self-esteem, creating social bonds, it is protecting people. Protecting uh, young boys from child recruitment, uh, protecting people. Because hopefully they will be safe in that because space. Because they are there in the school. Mm. Uh, uh, against sexual harassment, uh, uh, protecting girls uh, in relation to early marriages, uh, or we have dramatic situations in which families are driving their young girls into prostitution because they badly need that income. So having children in school in an emergency since the very beginning is also a key tool for the protection of children. Filippo Grandi, your organization has been looking after Palestinian refugees for generations now. What is the experience that you would bring from that? Well, I, I want to say that I was here, as you said, a year ago. And since then, we've been discussing with um, Her Highness and her team. Um, and what I want to stress is that we're very happy that they understood a fundamental point. We are an operation through which uh, education has been provided to now half a million Palestinian children through the Middle East. And that's been going on for, for more than six decades. The biggest challenge has been to do this, and this is a fundamental international responsibility, to do this so often in conflict. This operation, this human development operation has been interrupted by conflict. Through our dialogue with uh, education above all and, uh, and the team there, a dialogue that has culminated this morning in a signature of a partnership agreement, to which I'm very, very pleased. Um, we have now um, not only resources, but also very interesting tools to address this challenge. And the tools are simple. Uh, providing transport to children that cannot go to school because of, in this case, of conflict. Uh, providing special technology to allow those that are at home to learn through satellite TV, for example. Providing teachers with special skills to teach children that are traumatized. And this is just, these are just a few examples. And uh, uh, I just want to add one additional point that was not yet stressed. Uh, providing, you know, doing education work in emergencies, in conflict, 
is really like juggling many balls at the same time. In our case in particular, we have to keep our regular services running. We have to provide emergency education for those children that are dropping out of schools. But we have to start thinking also about the future, when the conflict is over, when refugees will return home, when Palestinians that are double refugees hopefully will return to Syria pending a solution to their original uh, to their original problem. Now, to juggle all those, those balls at the same time for agencies like ours is difficult, and that's why the issue of partnerships, further partnerships with others, is so fundamental. Thank you. Hans-Jürgen Werfels, you're the only representative of the donor community as such on here, and I don't want you to have to carry the can for all the donors who are out there, but let's face it, a lot of them are not honoring their pledges, and there's 10%, only 10% of the money that is required uh, to meet this need has been given. Let me uh, firstly emphasize uh, that Germany is really inspired uh, by the marvelous work uh, of Her Highness uh, Sheikha Mosa bin Nathar, and uh, we are uh, deeply impressed uh, by what uh, her initiative is uh, doing and uh, we decided uh, to join forces, uh, we decided to work together, and uh, yesterday in the afternoon here in Doha, uh, we signed a formal memorandum of understanding uh, to do a lot of uh, projects uh, together worldwide. Uh, Germany is, uh, when you are looking at the past, uh, a nation uh, which has changed uh, its uh, development uh, strategy uh, to a far extent. Uh, since a few years, uh, education is above all in Germany. Education is uh, uh, the most important uh, single issue uh, for our development uh, politics uh, worldwide. And uh, we are also uh, the largest donor in between uh, with uh, 1.3 billion euro, roughly around uh, 1.6 billion US dollars. Uh, we are the largest uh, donor for education uh, by far. Uh, but we also build up a strategy uh, where we take into account uh, that we have uh, to look not only uh, on basic schools but also on value chains, uh, also on the frame conditions uh, like it was already mentioned here at the podium uh, that uh, we have to take care uh, that uh, we need uh, somewhat like education chains uh, from school uh, to vocational training for instance yeah. to equip, uh, till to equip children lifelong for the future. learning and yeah. uh, when you are looking at the concrete uh, situation and a lot of our uh, partner countries uh, the biggest uh, disparity, disparity you can see, the biggest difference you can see is uh, between a girl in a rural uh, community uh, with uh, a poor family, and on the other hand, a boy in a more uh, wealthy family situation in a city. And I think uh, that makes clear where uh, we have uh, to put our priorities on. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, clearly, a lot more money is going to be needed. And, Your Highness, you're going to be putting the emphasis on new sources of funding. Um, where do you think those new sources of funding, you know, in, in an age of economic difficulty, where are those sources going to come from? Uh, from all Your microphone. I'm not, I'm not used to the mics, but... <laughs> I think we need to tap into all uh, different resources, different philanthropists, uh, new actors should come on board, uh, governments should fulfill their commitments uh, from within. I mean, they should start with their own societies first. Uh, there are communities there that have been marginalized in each state and each country. They have to be to, to, to integrate them and include them. Um, uh, we need really to, uh, to understand the importance of the education. Uh, unfortunately, uh, people are a little bit reluctant uh, uh, of supporting education because they are not aware, they are not understanding the importance of education. And they don't see it as, as, uh, as an economic imperative. So I think this is why it's important for us uh, not just to uh, conceptualize education as a basic need or as a human right. We need to see it also as an economic imperative that could also empower economic mm -hmm. growth and also empower individuals uh, uh, 
uh, economically. We know today that uh, uh, one extra year of personal uh, prime education could add to his uh, uh, future income by 10% and to the government and to the countries by 0.37%. Uh, so this is a, a big number. So if we can see it from this perspective, I think people will, will understand uh, and will take it seriously and will, uh, will set it and uh, uh, redesign uh, uh, their priorities differently. Yeah. Well, let's just talk about financing for a moment because I think here in the audience um, with us is Philippe Duce de Blasi, the UN under Secretary General for Innovative Financing. Monsieur Dusplazi, I know you've been working on innovative, innovative financing for a variety of sectors, health and, all, and also education. Where do you think the new money is going to come from? Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate Her Highness for her amazing work and this initiative. When uh, <clears throat> the Chancellor of Exchequer, Gordon Brown, in 2005, uh, did the <clears throat> International fa Finance Facility for Immunization. When we did in 2006 with President Chirac, President Lula, UNITE, based on a small levy tax on plane ticket, one dollar by uh, plane ticket. It's nothing, it's painless for the traveler. Everybody said, oh, it's nothing. It uh, cannot work. Now, thanks to United, one dollar by plane ticket in 15 countries, we raised more than three billion dollars. And eight out of 10 children already tweeted against HIV AIDS are tweeted thanks to United. And 350 million human beings against malaria. So what yeah. we did for health can be done with education. It's possible. When we work with Anthony Lake and UNICEF uh, for, to avoid the transmission of HIV from the mother for uh, the child, when we work with Clinton Foundation for Health, we can work now with UNESCO, Irina, uh, with uh, UNEDUC, the new uh, international body we are going to set up together for education. So, I think, to finish, that what we did with plane tickets, we can do now with other resources. For example, through internet, through mobile, through extractive resources, etc., etc., so I think that with innovative financing, we can change the world. Thank you. I mean, it is, it is very easy to do that uh, in health uh, because donors are very interested to see short-term dividends uh, uh, for, for their investments. But when it comes to education, it is a long-term oh. dividend, but it is the most powerful dividend because this is human resources that we are investing in. So that's why I think it's very important for us uh, to change the culture around education and to, uh, to, uh, to set this awareness of uh, how to, uh, the education is important to the societies and to communities and to the world. Yeah. And this is, I think, what is missing. As a politician, Gordon Brown, I mean, this is the problem, ex isn't it? it the the div ex <laughs> still, still an MP. <laughs> Still an MP. Still an MP. So still a politician. Um, but that's the problem, isn't it? The government, you know, a government would invest in something, but the dividend, they're never going to really see the benefit. Or it's unlikely, unless they're in power for a long time, yeah, they'll yeah, see but, the benefit. But education, let's be clear about this and tell the world, is the only way you can break the cycle of poverty. Uh, you can do lots of things in other different respects, but if you're going to change things for good, then you need to educate a generation of young people. And when I look at the conflict countries, and I've visited some of them, it is education, the idea that you are still building for the future, even when there is a conflict in your midst, that gives people hope about the future. So we have got to be uh, very evangelical in telling people about the importance of education. Funding, I, I think uh, what Her Highness has said is, is, is right, and I, I'm very interested in the new ideas from a very innovative uh, person in our, in, our, in our audience who's done a great deal already. Let us look at it this way. I believe that we have to raise six billion in 2015, additional to what we've got at the moment, if we've got a chance of meeting our aims. 
Let us say that philanthropy could raise a billion dollars. If we could bring a group of philanthropists together and let us then show how we could maximize uh, and multiply that figure to six billion, and I believe we could. Business companies in America, for example. 10 to 15 has been proved already. Hmm? One dollar, you invest one dollar in education, yeah. return will be 10 to 15 dollars. 10 to 15 dollars. And we've got to prove that to people. But business companies, business companies are giving more to health than to education. They should be giving money to education. Uh, I believe the public should be persuaded to give more to educating individual children and helping teachers. I believe that individual domestic governments in countries where they are off track are in a position to do more to contribute to education, and we've got to persuade them. Countries like Nigeria and India and Bangladesh could do a lot more themselves. And then I think the international aid agencies have got to coordinate their work more effectively and I believe that could raise a, a substantial amount of additional money, bringing in, for example, yeah. the regional development banks who don't do a huge amount at the moment. So I believe we could convert a billion into six billion in 2015 if we are coordinated in our effort. And I repeat, we've got to get every agency working in the same direction if we're going to make this the priority that Sheikh Moza has said to us is the priority, and that is to get every child to school. Yeah, and I suppose it's highlighting you know, what countries spend on different areas, whether it's education versus the military, and, and, and in some cases, um, perhaps shaming some of those governments. So this is a challenge to think in new ways, and there's lots more to discuss with the panel. But um, given that we're talking about innovation and we're talking about mobilizing at a mass uh, level, let's just talk about efforts at the grassroots, because there are plans underway for an education above all advocacy group. And I'd like to introduce to you now a group of people who are at the forefront of that advocacy. Please welcome them. So this is a group of people who have um, already shown an interest in education above all, and I'm going to um, just get a thought from each of them. Um, first, Rama Yad. Now, Rama, you're a French politician, um, born in Senegal, uh, former French MP, former Secretary of State for Human Rights. What does education above all mean to you? Um, you know, first of all, I'm very honored and um, proud uh, to take part in this new initiative of the of a fund uh, for uh, focused on out-of-school children. Um, you know, in the context of decreasing development aid, it's really crucial to build a large coalition of uh, donors, of contributors, um, to participate in this new fund. And um, the EAC fund has some innovative approaches. I would like just to take a few seconds to tell you. Uh, first of all, um, we think that it's important to have a southern leadership for this fund. Um, as you know, um, many funds are led by um, northern personalities mm. or structures, and it's important to have confidence in, in southern people. That's the first point. The second point is that we have to make public and uh, private um, contribution. It's important. It's important also to... Um, have confidence in, in migrants. It's important for them to take part in that project because they send a lot of money um, in, the, in the South. On the other hand, I think that um, as education is not a luxury thing, it's very, very important to make families on the ground understand that um, it's a necessary way to development, social and economic development. And so that's the why we, comes from them. Yeah, it's, it's important to base on, you know, community foundation, uh, to have confidence in them. And um, finally, I think of the donors, the contributors, uh, with the EAC uh, found, fund, it's, um, it will be a new opportunities for them, invest opportunities. They could be uh, donors, um, they could financially um, um, commit in, and uh, they could ha be shareholders uh, yeah. for the fund. That's okay. why... So um, an inclusive, an yeah, inclusive, it's inclusive approach. It's a, it's a new fund we are launching uh, now, um, and really we need your support because uh, without you we can do anything, and uh, with new and innovative and sustainable approaches, 
we could be uh, um, not compete, but uh, complete with uh, existing uh, initiatives. Complement each other. Well, sitting right next to Rama is Mutaz Isa Bashim, who's a very well-known Qatari athlete, um, a high jumper, a medalist at the London Olympics last year. What does education mean to you? Thank you. Thank Cle you very much. Clearly popular with everyone here. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, education is everything that's as we know today here and uh, I'm really happy and pleased to be here today, part of this team and this huge project. It's almost 2014 and all the numbers that have been seen of uh, children out of school, it's, it's a huge and that's a disaster of my life. It's really huge disaster because, you know, the children are the future and important for us to protect them and put them to school. And uh, that's why we need the whole world support. It's nothing that we you know just an individual like uh, work or one organization. So I think we need the whole world to be participate in this thing and uh, get them children to school. And I believe that uh, I'm very pleased. I believe I had my chance in life and that's why I achieved what I have done. So I believe these children also need to get uh, their chance in life and uh, we are all here to give them and to support them. Uh, and somehow I think the world have forgotten about these children. Me, myself, I didn't know that was this huge amount of children out of school. I was really shocked when I had some meeting with the guys here. I was like, wow, where have we been all this year? We complain about yeah. some stuff and when we look at these children here, we like, we have nothing to complain about. Yeah. And that's why we really have to put the spotlight on this section. Yeah, and all, they really were the forgotten yeah, children. Yeah, and all life Hopefully departments. not anymore. Yeah, and I'm really hopeful. Well, so. sitting right next to Amutaz is Tegla Lerup, who's a champion Kenyan marathon runner. So we have two high-achieving athletes <laughs> here with us. Thank you very much. And uh, I have to thank uh, Ines for inviting us. And thank you very much for being the mother of many, many disadvantaged children to give them a chance for education. Uh, I'm a sports person, as you said. Um, peace through sports. When we talk about education, it has a lot of components. There are children that they cannot go to school, but how can you disarm out their minds? When I left my country, I was one of those children. Thanks to sports, because it gave me the chance to be a sports person and get education. I went back home to give back to the community and my neighbors. So I use sports to disarm the minds of our children. And you support a school back we, home in Kenya today? Yeah, we built a school for, um, for education, sports, and we have a peace component. Thanks to the friends, thanks to the Kenya government for giving the teachers. And today, we are not talking about only about uh, why our children are being on the street. It's because of conflicts. It's because of the interest of human uh, interest. And that's why you see women and children are the ones who are suffering. If all women can sit and stand to educate our husbands, to educate our men, our, our sons, to emulate and feel pain for our children, we could not be using guns to make peace. I see about Africa. We are a rich country, but I feel pain as an African lady. Why? We have resources, but we turn our resources to be a conflict zone. We have ambassadors here. We can be all ambassadors for our continent so that we can have a lady, a mother like her, that have the heart of our children. Let's educate our children for better life for tomorrow and for the continent. Thank you very much. Thank you. And this... <laughs> and there is so much more work that needs to be done in Africa, and that was clear from what we heard already. Now, also here, Hesal Naimi and Nasser Abdullah al Atiyah, you're both from Georgetown University, and you're both part of um, education above all. Hesa, you have seen some of this work in, in Brazil. Yeah, um, I went to Brazil. Uh, by the end of September this year and um, the gravity of what education means to children really hit me because I went to a classroom that was filled with 30 children in a 3 by 3 classroom. It was stuffy and, and these children were, were all packed together but <clears throat> 
they all were holding a book and they were reading and they were getting educated. And when we were, you know, we were talking about it, we were very astonished and I was whispering to my colleagues, they asked me quite politely to stop talking because it was interrupting them. And that really shocked me because these children are, are sitting in a packed room and despite all of that, despite the fact that they're an indigenous tribe or the fact that they were in, a, in one of the poorest favelas in Brazil, they still had a curiosity that was so innate and so pure in them that we sometimes forget children have. And I'm thankful to have come from a privileged background where my education was always given to me and I, and I always believed it was a right. And of course it is a right. But sometimes we forget that. And sometimes yeah. we don't realize that children, you know, children, they have this curiosity that needs to, be, needs to be nourished. They need to be in tune with their individualism. And that can only happen if we provide it to every single child, not only in the impoverished areas, but also re, reshape education in areas like Qatar or in the region that do have money, but also need, need to make children more aware of their potential because curiosity does go a long way. Yeah, it really does. Um, Nasser, what does this project mean to you? Uh, at first, well, I didn't, I didn't know a lot about uh, education and the, the difficulties that children from all around the world had to go through. Well, I was privileged enough to have an education from primary school until university. However, after I attended the Malala Day at the UN this summer, I, I learned a very important lesson, as Hassel said. Education isn't a luxury, it's a right. And uh, Martin Luther King once said, I had a dream. I also have a dream that all children around the world should have access to a good education, regardless from where they're from, or what family they're from, or which country they, they, they've been from. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, our education above all advocates, thank you. Thank you so much. And I have to say, you, you meant, NASA mentioned Malala, and I spent a lot of time uh, this year covering her story, including visiting her school in Pakistan. And after you spend time with a story like that, it's made me more grateful than ever before for my own education. But amidst all these challenges, there are success stories. And if you were here last year, I'm sure you will remember a lady called Swad Sharif, who uh, spoke about her own experience in the Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya, where she'd become the head teacher of her school. And I'm really pleased to say that um, Swad is back with us here today. Um, Swad, welcome. And I think now you're at the next stage of your own education. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to, to be here and to speak. I really appreciate, first of all, Her Highness, Sheikh Moza, for inviting me again in this, in this year. <clears throat> uh, I have been here last year, and the last year has been an amazing year for me. It has changed me, it has changed, it has changed my life, it has changed my community, it has changed the peoples that I teach, and it has changed the uh, Kakuma refugee camp, if I say in general. It has changed me in one way, uh, in many ways. Like, for example, when I went back, uh, honestly, always had made me to be a wise lady. I can say, because when I went back, uh, the inspiration Her Highness has given me, what I have learned from the people around, has made me to realize that I can still go back and continue my studies. I have been, I, I was in a, in a diploma, I was doing in a diploma, so I tried my best and worked hard and finished my diploma, uh, it was an associate degree in, in a distant learning. It, was, it is an online studies in one of the university in America called Regis University. I worked hard and I got a distinction. So I was very, very happy because the inspiration, the inspiration Her Highness has given me, she has empowered me. She has made me to be strong because as a lady, uh, when I see her, I see, okay, I, can, I am a lady also and I can be like, Although I cannot be like her, but then I can try. <laughs> I can really try and uh, make uh, a, a change. And, I can change. And so, so you've done your diploma, but you now have a place to study in the US, right? Uh, um, I'm going to be resettled in the US, but then I haven't get, I'm still looking for my, my master, and I still have my vision of uh, what I have said last year of being uh, someone or working with Her Highness, or maybe being a Ban Ki-moon, taking that position, being the first lady of uh, that position. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you, Swad Sharif. 
Thank you, Swad. Um, and you really good luck. I suppose this is the challenge of lifelong learning because you've been responsible for the education of so many children in your school, but you also now can think about the next stage of your own education. Highness has really uh, assisted my school a lot because she has sent a lot of gifts and my learners have really changed. She has sent uh, bags for the learners. Many have, last year we were having 1,000 in my school, there were 1,400. This year, there were 1,900 learners. And right. we got more classrooms. Many learners want to come. We have arranged also, we came up, I, I, I introduced different projects, like a program. Uh, I talked with my fellow, I talked with my community, and uh, whatever I have learned from here, I shared with them, and then I told them how we can improve the education Great. in the camp. So that is passing it on. Thank you so much, you so Swad Sharif. <laughs> Antonio Guterres, you, you, you know what refugee camps are like, and Kakuma is a very big you know, refugee camp that's been there for a long time. I mean, this is such a significant achievement, because to make it out of the camp and to get to the next stage of your education, that would be a dream for many children in the camp. Well, I think that what is amazing is to see the resilience, the capacity, the courage, and the determination of uh, uh, the refugee population. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's an enormous amount of energy that is there that unfortunately is frozen, and we need to unleash it. And one of the ways to unleash it is to make sure that there is education with quality and with sustainability in refugee settings, be it in camps or with local communities. And this is the objective of the educated child. Uh, let's be honest, we are doing very little compared with the needs. Only two-thirds of the children in a refugee situation in the world go to primary school. Only one-third go to secondary school. We have a lot of advocacy to do with states. We have education programs in 72 countries. In 21 of them, states do not allow refugee children to go to their schools. In 17 of them, states do not recognize diplomas from the countries of origin. So there is a lot to be done uh, in order to make sure that populations displaced inside their countries or outside their countries, or population trapped in conflicts, like we see in some of the villages and towns in Syria, that these populations can have a chance to educate their children because the potential that that will generate for yeah. those countries will be immense. immense and then yeah. uh, the economic potential. she's going to the US. Yeah. We, every year, we resettle about 72,000 people from countries of first asylum in the developing world to the US, to Canada, to Europe, to Australia. And I mean, it's, it's a huge difference. If isn't you go, that harder than if, ever if, before? That is harder. I mean, the, the resettlement, the refugee, getting countries to accept, I mean, that, that's much harder today than it no, was it's, before. No, it's, it's growing. It's, it's slowly growing. Uh, there are more opportunities, uh, okay. even if it's, it's tough. But it's a huge difference. If you move into the American society, for a master degree, it's completely different than if you move into the American society to work in construction. Yeah. And this is something yeah, that we need to understand because it is something that makes a difference in the lives of people. Yeah. Well, we've been talking about the, the forgotten children, but actually, you know, the aim and the hope is to give those children a voice. And actually, we have some questions from so-called forgotten children in different parts of the world, and they're questions for you as the panelists. So I want to bring in the first of those questions now. Um, this one comes from um, a girl called Bekoy, who is from the indigenous Chacrine tribe in the Amazon rainforest in Brazil. <laughs> How will you help me with my study so I can become a nurse one day? That is her ambition. Um, you, Johannes, you, you, you went to this community. Yes, I was there, and I have seen situation, the situation there of the children, and uh, it is really it is, uh, very um, devastating. And uh, it's, um, again, this is very much to do with the uh, recogni recognizing the culture there, because most of the kids there, most of their parents, they are electing to learn because the, what the, the textbooks that are not there, uh, it's not written with their languages. Uh, it's written with other language. Uh, so there is a reluctant uh, uh, fearing uh, uh, the loss of their language, or the loss of their culture, and the loss in the end of their identities. 
So it's important that we, first of all, recognize this, uh, be sensitive to, to, to their culture, and try to develop uh, textbooks uh, uh, in their own languages. Uh, by this, we are building the trust. By this, we are helping them to be exposed to the rest of the world. I was shocked uh, with some of the questions that they were raised by the children. One of them was, uh, do you have children like us? Can you imagine? They have no imagination of what exists outside uh, the border of their jungle. They don't know that there are people like them living somewhere else. So to be exposed, they have to communicate, and to be, to, to be able to communicate, they have to have the language. But to learn other language, first they have to learn their own language. Yes, but this is a real dilemma, isn't it? It's a, it's a, Irina Bukova, in one way, they're trying to preserve their language, but at the same time, to prepare them from the outside world. I mean, in, in the case of these children, they would need Portuguese and then, you know, ideally another language. I think what Her Highness says uh, resonates very deeply with uh, uh, what I believe it, what uh, we at UNESCO have been doing uh, for a number of years. Uh, it's about uh, multilingualism, it's about um, uh, studying in the mother tongue language, uh, particularly in the primary uh, school age. Uh, we have abundance of examples of data uh, why belonging to a, a linguistic minority or indigenous population is reason for exclusion. We speak about all these uh, 57 million children that are not going to school and part of them belong exactly to such excluded minorities. Uh, and uh, we deeply believe that if at the primary level there is a mother tongue language, uh, then families can support them and that they can learn. Of course, uh, it's, uh, it requires a legislative framework in many countries, uh, recently in the Philippines, before that in Bolivia, in Mexico, uh, in many countries in the world, in, in India, of course, uh, uh, in Brazil, uh, already there are such uh, systems introduced. So some countries would see those languages as a threat and, and don't. Yes, but let me also mention them. something also important. Yeah, briefly, if you will. In the world, there are 6,000 languages, and 3,000 of them will disappear by the end of the century. So it has to be linked very much also with the cultural and, and, and linguistic diversity. And uh, if we are uh, prone for the fact that if we set an agenda post-2015 on education, it has to have also this sensitivity of cultural yeah. diversity, of linguistic diversity, because this is the way we can reach to the marginalized. Yeah. There is no other way. And it's not perceived as something from, from the outside. And it is hopefully. not perceived as something Tony important. I just wanted to... Hello, hello. Yep. I just wanted to add briefly that it's the teachers also. And we need to find better ways to get teachers into these areas. Uh, and we are discovering that if you train the teachers who are already there, you do better than trying to teach, train the younger teachers and then to convince them to go there. Yeah. But unless we have the teachers from these areas, we're not going to okay. uh, succeed. Um, another example from a really hard to reach part of the world, the Democratic Republic of Congo. I highlighted already just how extreme the difficulty is there. We don't actually know for sure how many out of school children are there, but it could be as many as 7 million or arguably even more. So here are a couple of voices from DRC. So there are two issues there. What's happened to schools and infrastructure after a disaster, also poverty, and of course there's a huge issue um, in the Congo with violence and how that is preventing um, children going to school. Let's just talk about that for a moment because we have with us Luis Moreno Ocampo, the former chief um, prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. You're now on the Education Above All um, board. In terms of violence in Congo, is it realistic ever to, to hope to bring people responsible to justice? In some way, Congo suffered the consequence of the Rwanda genocide. Congo was in, in a bad situation in the 90s, but then the genocide in Rwanda transformed Congo into a two Congo wars that destroyed the country. More than 3 million people died. And, but I think I like what Mr. Gutierrez said, the idea unleash the energy of the educators and the students. And in this sense, I think the world is evolving, and the educator here should know about that. Uh, now, for instance, using a child as a soldier 
is a war crime. Now, for instance, when the national courts fail to prosecute the cases, there is a permanent international criminal court ready to intervene. And in fact, in the first trial, in its first trial, the international criminal court convicted a leader from Congo, Thomas Lubanga, for using children under the age of 15 as soldiers. And the evidence of the case showed the connection of the cow conflict affected education, how Congo was affected. Because the children were abducted when they go going to the school. And it's not just they lost the right to education. They were wrongly educated. Girls were used as sex slaves. Boys were trained to rape. All of them, all of them were forced to kill. So it's not just they lost education, they were transformed into killers. And that is what the, the problem we have. And the issue is how we unleash the energy of education, how we transform that. And I always remember in my first meeting with Sheikh Hamosa, she insisted that the focus should be these kids, these kids who suffer this type of crimes. And I, for me, it was interesting because the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court made a partnership with um, education above all that was very useful. For us, they help us to present to the judges they not just the child was, the children were abducted, they lost this right of education. They explained that to the judges. Yeah. But also we provide to the education of all information that we collected and they use it to produce a report how the conflict affect the schools. So for me, that was a good example, but for me it's just the beginning. We need to do what Mr. Gutierrez said, unleash the energy of education. We have seven global leaders here and hundreds of educators here. That's the next challenge, how they can take their ideas and put in the schools and use the schools to transform the schools. Yeah. That, I think, is a challenge. Thank you. Well, the protection of, of schools in, in Syria is also a significant issue, and I want to go on to talk about um, Syria next. Um, first, let, let's just bring in the voice of one girl in Syria. This is Ghazal, who is living in Lebanon's Beka Valley. So, of course, no one is going to know when she's ever going to get back to Syria and finish her education, or, because the state of education in Syria and for the refugees outside um, is really dire. Uh, Tony Lake, I know, I mean, actually, I think all of you in different ways are, are working on Syria. What would you say the biggest challenge is there? Uh, I'm just back from Syria yesterday, uh, and it is horrendous. 3,000 schools destroyed, 2 million kids out of school. But we can't get discouraged. In fact, progress is possible. Uh, we are now supporting 300,000 children uh, in remedial education. Uh, we are trying to get a million uh, packets of school supplies out on both sides of the line. So progress is possible. We're not doing enough, but we uh, are making progress. But I want to focus also, to come back to her question, uh, on the one million uh, children, as Antonio and I have been talking about, uh, who are refugees uh, beyond. Uh, children in Jordan, in Turkey, in Iraq, and in Lebanon. And in Lebanon, uh, it, there is a huge burden being put on the Lebanese government, as Gordon uh, is uh, working so well on. Uh, and we need to really ramp up uh, our efforts to give the children in Lebanon where there are no camps. So they are In the community. They, have, they are in the local communities, which is putting a huge pressure on the schools. If the chil those children do not get the skills and the belief in their hearts in reconciliation, uh, then they can't go back to Syria uh, as successfully because they won't have the skills to contribute. If I could uh, just make a general point from this, uh, which is that we are seeing in the camps in Jordan and elsewhere uh, a loss of that optimism, a loss of that energy. The drawings that we're seeing from the children are increasingly yeah. hopeless and dark and violent. If we don't, and we are working on this in a new initiative, if we don't ramp up uh, our work in education and yeah. protection, what we're going to see in the next generation is a generation of children who have become the leaders and the workers in Syria and the surrounding yeah. country. Uh, potentially who, a lost generation. Right. So. A final point, if I may. 
we've talked about education as an investment in development. Yes, it is. But let us also never forget the pictures that we saw of the children today who so desperately need those safe, secure places uh, that they can get in a school. And let's remember that this is also about peace, not just development, but about peace. Because if they don't have the skills in their heads and the desire for reconciliation in their heart, then the next generation is going to replicate yeah. what we're seeing but today. But what happens when children are not safe in school? There's lots of evidence from Syria about schools being attacked. Um, at the BBC, we covered a shocking case at the end of August where a, a school playground was hit in, in a chemical weapons attack, and some of you might have seen the, the horrifying pictures as a result. Protection of schools is now an increasingly urgent issue, and perhaps they can be protected along the lines of the way that healthcare institutions are protected in armed conflict. Um, we put this question about the protection of schools. It is a legal right. And we put this question uh, to the International Red Cross President, Peter Mora, and this is what he said. ICRC is dealing uh, differently with, uh, in different ways with, uh, uh, with this issue. First and foremost, by recalling the obligations of international humanitarian law which outlaws and illegalizes the attack on schools, on teachers, on children. Then, of course, by engagement with armed groups and armed forces in order to respect international humanitarian law and the principles of conduct of hostilities, in particular, the distinction between civilian and military in infrastructures, but also the obligation to precautionary measures in combat. But then again, ICRC is very keen to participate concretely uh, to alleviate the suffering of children in those difficult contexts by helping to rebuild schools, by psychosocial treatment, uh, by also uh, providing space uh, for children and families displaced so that education can continue even in the most difficult situations but also by looking at children in prison who are particularly, particularly vulnerable. ICRC knows that uh, we are only looking at one specific or, or couple of specific perspectives and that many other actors do a lot to contribute to alleviate and mitigate uh, the issue of education at risk. We are eager to cooperate with others and to keep the broader perspective of vulnerabilities of society as a life. So that's Peter Mora, the ICRC president. Let's hope for a world where children are at least safe in school and whatever the challenges they face elsewhere. I'm going to get a quick final thought, um, ideally from all of you if, if we can, just about what needs to be done in the future. Irina Bokova. I just wanted to, to react a little bit to this yeah. particular question, what can be done. Uh, and I think, of course, uh, uh, it's important to have an overall political will and to put this uh, very strongly on the uh, uh, global, even security agenda. I just want to remind that in 2011, uh, we UNESCO we published uh, with our global monitoring reports, uh, the topic was uh, education in conflict. And it was very, uh, I would say, uh, uh, adamantly picked up by the Security Council. And for the first time, there was a resolution introduced into the Security Council by Germany as a non-permanent member in July 2011, which included for the first time among the topics of children in conflict until that time, Security Council was dealing only with children soldiers and uh, some of these humanitarian situations. So for the first time, more of an issue. they put education yeah. among the list of those situations attacked that Security Council in thought important also to discuss in such conflict areas. I think this is very important to remind because it is yeah. not sufficiently probably utilized. hans jürgen Beerfeld, you, you, you were talking about what's been done already, but you know, in a year's time, where would you like us to be? 
Oh, I think there's uh, still a lot to do, and we uh, really not made uh, our political homework uh, now. All of us, uh, when you are looking at uh, the problem of uh, fragmentation, uh, we are all loving uh, delivering as one uh, from the United Nations. Uh, we are all loving the new World Bank strategy, but uh, uh, we are in fact uh, far away uh, from a very good uh, and prosperous cooperation, uh, for instance, uh, with the Global Partnership for Education. Uh, which is not uh, on the table here. And uh, when you are looking in the room. Uh, at uh, other points like domestic resources mobilization, uh, we have uh, to do a little bit more, in my mind, uh, to put um, pressure into the process uh, of our negotiations with a lot of partner countries, uh, some of them uh, having enough money to buy weapons uh, and uh, not enough uh, money to invest uh, in their own education systems yeah. uh, that are also political duties okay. where we have to talk about. Um, we have a couple more minutes here, all of us except for Gordon Brown, because I think His Highness um, the Emir is waiting for you, so oh. you are actually... Um, we, we, we have to let you go now, but thank you very much um, for being here, and hopefully we will be in a better place in a year's thank time. You thank thank you. you. Gordon Brown. Thank you. So, so, just a couple of, um, of final thoughts. Of Filippo Grandi, how much do you, I, I mean, I suppose, you know, your organization first dealt with an emergency situation which has turned into a long-term situation. And, you know, let's all hope that Syria doesn't end up like that, but it's an awareness to have in the, in the back of our minds. The, the thought, uh, the last thought I wanted to share with you, I, I was inspired by the words of uh, Swad from Kakuma when she said that the investment made in her made her a wise woman or a wiser woman. Um, you know, we, we have that now for 64 years with children that are the victims of a conflict, of the mother of all conflicts, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the unresolved conflict par excellence. And many times we're asked, why do you continue to provide education? Why this operation after so long continues? And I would say that besides the obvious, you know, it is a human right, uh, uh, children deserve and must have education. I think that uh, there is an investment there which is also political. It's an investment in peace from a strategic point of view. We, the children coming out of our school, will be wiser children, will be wise children, and for the difficult compromises of peace, be it peace in Syria, or be it the broader peace in the Middle East, you will need wise people. Yes, um, Your Highness. Where would you like us to be in, in a year's time? First, I want to comment on the issue of violence here. Uh, yes, there are laws there. Uh, we have enough uh, uh, legal uh, uh, frames when it comes to uh, uh, protecting education. We have the humanitarian law. We have uh, the international human rights law. We have the criminal law. But what's missing, I think, in my opinion, are the mechanisms where we could really use to implement these laws. Uh, so far, I think these uh, mechanisms uh, don't exist. Uh, therefore, uh, these, uh, the, uh, the laws are not being enforced. Uh, what's left? I think there, are, there is still a lot to do, but I'm opti opti optimistic. Uh, I can see today that, that there is a global uh, movement uh, to support uh, equality, quality uh, uh, universal primary education. Uh, we want to see uh, this enduring uh, 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 a, a collective partnership uh, that will result into uh, uh, the uh, cross-fertilization ideas that will sustain education. Uh, I want to see uh, a sort of momentous change uh, in our, of our attitudes. Our attitudes should be changed towards education. We have to see education as uh, the central of all causes. Uh, we know today that education has economic benefits, health benefits, social and political benefits. Education can promote democracy, but of course education can uh, uh, protect uh, children against uh, uh, 
uh, violation. Uh, we know that children are out of schools are more uh, likely to be engaged in, in violence than others. So we know the importance of education. Understanding the power of education and changing individuals, societies, uh, will help us uh, to reset our agenda and set uh, and put education first. Thank you. Well, of course, success is going to mean turning commitments and pledges into a reality. And um, I want to show you now um, a reminder of why we're all here. I want to be a surgeon so that I'll help my community. I want to be a journalist. I want to become ambassador. Be a teacher. A teacher. I will become minister of education. I want to be an engineer. I'm famous. Advocate. There you go. We've called them the forgotten children, but let's, let's not forget them any longer. Just um, two words before we close this session. One is that if you have followed this conversation, thanks to the work of our translators on your headsets, please leave them in the room or on your way out because we've lost quite a lot of them already and we don't want to lose any more. So please don't take them with you. And if you'd like to know more about the next stage of education above all, there's a session on a year of acceleration and reinvention that is beginning in Auditorium 1 at 11 o'clock. And my final privilege is to thank Her Highness and all the panel for all the work that they are doing. And thank you all for listening and may it be a productive year ahead. Thank you.